This is Space Time, Series 25, Episode 6. Coming up on Space Time, the killer White Dwarf stars, the International Space Station now to keep flying until at least 2030, and China ends 2021 with a record 55 orbital rocket launches. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have discovered a killer white dwarf which is ripping a nearby planet, brown dwarf of very low mass star, to pieces. As well as its relentless gravitational pull, the white dwarf's also bombarding this object with intense blasts of energy and radiation. Most stars, including our Sun, will become white dwarves. This involves them running out of hydrogen in their core to fuse into helium. And when this happens, the balancing act between nuclear energy pushing outwards and gravity pushing inwards ends, and gravity wins. All the mass of the star piling on the core causes the core to contract. This increases its temperature and pressure, and eventually it gets hot enough to start fusing helium into carbon and oxygen. At the same time, an area just outside the contracted core has also moved down far enough towards the centre to increase temperatures and pressures and begin burning a shell of hydrogen into helium. The heat of this shell burning causes the outer layers of the star to expand outwards, and being further away from the core, they cool down. The star has turned into a red giant. Eventually, the helium burning in the core has been converted into oxygen and carbon. And as these stars aren't massive enough to fuse oxygen and carbon into heavier elements, they die. The outer layers float away as planetary nebulae, exposing the white-hot stellar core about the size of the Earth and referred to as a white dwarf. Eventually, over trillions of years, white dwarves will cool down to become black dwarves. But the universe hasn't been around long enough yet for that to happen. Scientists using NASA's Chandra X-ray Telescope, as well as the European Space Agency's XMM-Newton Space Observatory, have discovered some unusual X-ray activity occurring in three white dwarf stars. Now, typically, white dwarfs give off low-energy X-rays, which researchers saw in their sample. However, these white dwarfs also had surprisingly bright X-ray emissions at higher energies. Now, one of the white dwarves, catalogued as KPD 0005 plus 5106, stood out to astronomers because it had high-energy X-ray emissions that were increasing and decreasing in brightness every 4.7 hours. Now, this recurring ebb and flow of X-rays indicates that something, either a big planet or a brown dwarf or maybe a small star, is in orbit around the white dwarf. Material from the orbiting object appears to be slamming into the north and south poles of the white dwarf, creating a bright spot of high-energy X-ray emissions. So as the white dwarf and its companion orbit around each other, these hot spots would go into and out of view, causing the high-energy X-rays to regularly increase and decrease. Located some 1,300 light years away, this white dwarf is one of the hottest known in the universe, with surface temperatures of around 200,000 degrees Celsius. Now, by comparison, the surface temperature of our Sun is about 6,000 degrees. The companion object, whatever it is, is about 800,000 kilometres away from the white dwarf, relatively close in astronomical terms. The study's authors looked at what would happen if this object turned out to be a planet with a mass similar to that of Jupiter, the largest planet in our solar system. Now, that's a possibility that agrees with the data more readily than either a dim star or a brown dwarf. The models show that the white dwarf would be pulling material off the planet so quickly, the planet would only survive for a few hundred million years before being completely destroyed. This material will then swirl around the white dwarf glowing in X-rays, which the Chandra telescope can detect. Now, the two other white dwarfs in the study appear to be solitary objects, but they do show similar energetic X-ray emissions, so they may well have faint companions orbiting around them as well, possibly small planets. The whole scenario provides a really good picture as to what will happen with our own Sun and Solar System and our own planet Earth in about 7 billion years' time, when our Sun also descends into its white dwarf phase. This is Space Time. Still to come. The International Space Station to continue flying until at least 2030. 
And China tops the 2021 list of orbital rocket launches. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Washington has formally extended the life of the International Space Station to 2030. The space station was expected to be deorbited around 2028. NASA says the move's designed to allow a seamless transition to the start of operations of several planned commercial space stations. While the European Space Agency, the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency and the Canadian Space Agency are on board with NASA on the mission extension, Russia's already announced plans to leave the International Space Station in either 2024 or 2025. The Russian Federal Space Agency at Roscosmos is concerned that some of the Russian modules on the orbiting outpost have already reached their use-by dates. There have already been numerous leaks and several equipment failures involving the Russian segment. Moscow has already started building the first core module of a new Russian space station, and several recently added Russian-built modules docked to the International Space Station are likely to be transferred to the new Russian space station once it's in orbit. NASA recently awarded Blue Origin, NanoRacks and Northrop Grumman $415 million towards the development of independent space stations, which will be used by both government and private sector customers. Other companies, meanwhile, are looking at attaching their own modules to the existing International Space Station, gradually building up as part of the ISS before moving off into their own orbits. Of course, NASA, ESA, JAXA and Canada are continuing development of the new Lunar Gateway Space Station, which will act as a base camp for human Artemis missions down to the surface of the Moon and eventually onto Mars. In April last year, NASA awarded a $2.89 billion contract to SpaceX in order to continue development of its reusable HLS Starship Lunar Lander, which will be part of the Artemis program, transporting crew and cargo between the Gateway Space Station and the lunar surface. The first modules of the International Space Station were launched in 1998. This is Space Time, still to come. The Powerhouse Museum's Sydney Observatory launches its 2022 Australasian Sky Guide and China tops 2021 in orbital launches. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Teaching your kids about astronomy and taking them into the backyard or park at night to gaze up at the skies, pointing out key stars, constellations and planets, is one of the best ways to spark their interest in science and open up an exciting new world for them. And in this regard, listeners in the Southern Hemisphere are especially blessed because they have the planet's best views of the cosmos, including the nearest star systems to Earth, the best views of the galactic centre of the Milky Way, as well as stunning vistas of some of the nearest satellite galaxies. The Powerhouse Museum Sydney Observatory has launched the 32nd and latest edition of its popular Australasian Sky Guide, providing stargazers and the general public with an easy-to-follow tour of the majestic southern night skies. And it's a great companion to our monthly Skywatch Guide. The Australasian Sky Guide, which has been published annually since 1991, contains the latest star maps and information on all the key astronomical events expected over the coming year. 2022's highlights include two supermoon events in June and July, a total lunar eclipse in November and Mars opposition in December, when the red planet will be just 81,450,876 kilometres from Earth. This year's guide also examines the fascinating science of First Nations astronomy and the key role it played in traditional Aboriginal life. The 2022 guide was written by Dr Nick Lom, consultant curator of astronomy at the Powers Museum Sydney Observatory. Lom says this year's cover highlights the spectacular spiral galaxy NGC 134, a bejeweled oasis located some 60,000 light-years away in the constellation Sculptor. 
The image, using red, green, blue and luminous filters, took 18 hours of exposure time to capture. It's from a photographer called Marcus Davis. Every year we take the cover photograph from the um, David Merlin Awards, honourable mentions or winners in the annual David Merlin Awards that are, that's run by the Central West Astronomical Society. It's very much a symbol of where we are in the universe, you know, a little island galaxy floating all by ourselves. Yeah, it, it would be probably quite similar to our own galaxy, to Milky Way. Um, you can see that it's more yellow stars which means older stars in the centre and uh, younger stars out in the spiral arms had younger blue stars. There's a lot of information just in the photograph, but it is a very spectacular one to, to look at. There are quite a number of highlights for the year. They all would be very good opportunities to take photographs. These days, even mobile phones have good cameras. Some of them have night vision built into them. So uh, people be, can experiment with taking astronomical photographs. So one highlight is the morning of the 1st of May when uh, the bright planet Venus is close to another bright planet, Jupiter. So the two brightest planets in the night sky will be very close to each other, only separated by half the width of the moon. It is in the morning sky, but I think it should be spectacular enough to get up for. Then there is another event. A few days later, the morning of the 7th of May, is a meteor shower. These are Aquarius meteor shower. That's the one associated with Halley's Comet. Dust particles given up by Halley's Comet are spread out among its, along its orbit, along its path around the sun, and we bump into that path every year around 6th, 7th of May. And this year should be fairly good because there's no moon. The moon is always the problem. It can be the problem with meteor showers, but there's no moon to start. So uh, again, it's worthwhile getting up for it to try and watch the shower. And as a bonus, there are four planets visible at the same time. Then uh, the following month, and in fact, the month after, there are supermoons. Now, supermoons are when the moon is, is full and it's close to the Earth at the same time. It is closest point to the Earth. There are no proper definition of supermoon because not really an astronomical term. It was there invented are... by an astrologer, wasn't it, back in the 1970s? That's correct. That's right. So it's not really an astronomical term, but... That's a definition. I understand, because it was just a cool term to use and it got people interested in astronomy. Well, exactly. And it's a good excuse to, uh, to watch the moon rise, and the moon rise is always good to watch or to photograph. In fact, by eye, it actually looks bigger. Um, and that could make an interesting comparison. Eye looks much bigger than it does through a camera because there is an illusion called the moon illusion. Our brain somehow, when the moon is near the horizon, when it's rising, looks bigger than it is overhead. Yeah, so I've always thought it, that. It, you know, big and yellow near the horizon and then gradually it seems to shrink. And it's purely a psychological thing, is it? Exactly. Exactly. So by taking photographs, so you could take a photograph as it's rising, then it's rising, and when it's overhead, it's exactly the same size. But to us, somehow, we think if something is on the horizon, it looks bigger than it's overhead. Somehow, it's it's a matter of perspective and which the brain tries to compensate for. So that's something that's worthwhile looking at, photographing, and Wiggle Deal, the very most exciting event of the year, is on the 8th of November when uh, we have a total eclipse of the moon. And they are always great to watch. And they're because, safe too. Uh, it's not like looking at the sun. It's, uh, it's quite exactly, safe to watch the lunar exactly, eclipse. Exactly. It's completely safe. The moon looks reddish. People rave on about the blood moon, but I, mean, I think that's going too far. It doesn't go that red, but it, and you can never tell in advance how red it's going to be because it depends on the state of our atmosphere around the world. So if there's a lot of dust in the atmosphere, then it's not so red. It's when the, when the air is clear. So if there's been a, if a volcanic eruption or some other similar event, then, uh, then it can be a fairly dark eclipse and not particularly red. So it does vary depending on circumstances. And it happens in the evening, so 
again, makes it convenient to watch. Children may have to stay up a little bit later than, than usual, but still it's something that's unusual and worthwhile and it's not going to happen again for uh, another four years, so not till 2025 before we treat it to another total eclipse of the moon. And just mentioning why it's red, I mean, to me, always the easiest way, to, there are lots of ways of explaining it, but to me the easiest way is to think about a, an astronaut on the moon. When we see an eclipse of the moon, the astronaut will see a total eclipse of the sun with the Earth covering the sun. And around the edge of the Earth, it would be red. And that's red from uh, there are places where it's uh, either, either the sun is rising or the sun is setting. And that red light is reflects of the moon, and that's why the moon appears red. All the Earth's sunrises and sunsets happening at once. That, exactly, exactly. So it's quite fascinating. I mean, just to even imagine that somehow you can see all those sunrises and all those sunsets in one go. Then uh, one month later, 8th of December, we have an opposition of Mars. It's quite a favourable opposition. It's not as favourable as it, as it can be, but it's favor, fairly favourable. Mars oppositions when the Earth catches up with the uh, slow moving Mars, and Mars is at its closest to Earth for, uh, Earth for several years. This time it will be 81 million kilometres away, which is quite in astronomical terms, it's quite close. Not as close as it was in uh, 2003, 19 years ago now, when it was 56 million. 56 I remember million. it like it was yesterday. <laughs> exactly. For most, for most people involved in astronomy, it's a very exciting time. So in uh, 2003, Mars was 56 million kilometres away. And in 2022, it's 81 million kilometres away. So there will be a difference. Mars will appear uh, not quite as big as it did in 2003, but it's still a great opportunity to try and go to an observatory or planetarium or somewhere or to an amateur group, amateur astronomical group, uh, people with telescopes and look through Mars with a telescope. And you should see the polar caps of Mars, if not some of the dark marking on the planet. What you will not see, unfortunately, is canals. There is no there are no canals and people don't sleep canals anymore. Canali. Uh, canali, yes, yes, that's right. Well, that's what orig originally the first observer at, a, I was thinking back in 18, at the opposition in 1877, saw dark lines on the, what he thought was the dark lines on the surface of Mars, and he reported to me, because he's an Italian astronomer, as Canali. He didn't want to indicate that they are actually uh, artificial, but then it was taken up by American astronomers, especially Percy Lowell, and uh, then uh, he translated it as canals, which has the connotation that it's artificial. And Percy Lowell then built a great theory about uh, this uh, civilization losing water and they built these huge great canals from the margin polar caps to the equatorial regions and that's a great example of planetary wide cooperation. Unfortunately, none of that is true and there's no, no canals. So people are not going to see canals at the Martian position December this year. But the good news is it means the Martians aren't invading either. Well, that's true. That's true. I mean, that Martian invasion really scared people in the 1930s, actually, uh, after the radio program, which had H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds, and they broadcasted as if it was a true event. People who missed the beginning of the broadcast um, assumed it was news. They were listening to genuine news broadcasts about Martian invasion. Now, one of the features in this year's edition of the Sky Guide is how the moon and stars helped Indigenous people predict the weather. Yeah, that's uh, that's fascinating. And that's uh, written by a lady called uh, Carly Noon, who's a Gamilaroi astronomer and science communicator. And she explains how halos around the moon can be an indicator of when to weather that's coming up, I think an indication of rain. Some indigenous groups use the twinkling of stars. Depending on how much twinkling they can see what the weather is going to be and again when the rain is going to start. So it's quite a fascinating article in, in this year's Sky Guide. As always, the Sky Guide is what we use at Space Time to put together our Sky Watch program every month. And where does one get the Sky Guide? It's widely available from bookstores. The recommended Price is sixteen dollars 
95 cents, which I think maybe I'm slightly biased, but I think it's a bargain price. But in fact, if you look around online, it's available from bookstores for a little bit less than that. Just searching for it online, um, you can see there are a lot of bookstores which sell it at that sell it online. And uh, I'm sure if you go into any of the major bookstores, they would have that copies as well. Certainly, the easiest way if you don't go into bookstores due to uh, COVID or any other reason, you can get it online. And of course, from the Powerhouse Museum, Sydney Observatory as well. I note that the uh, Powerhouse Museum is open. Sydney Observatory is closed for restoration at the moment, refurbishment, and I think will be for another few months. But it should be fantastic when it's completed. I understand some major work is being done on the building and the exhibition. And the 2022 Australasian Sky Guide is available at all good bookstores and online from the Powerhouse Museum Sydney Observatory at mwas.museum forward slash store. This is Space Time. Still to come, China's ended 2021 with a record 55 orbital rocket launches and later in the science report, a new study shows that cyclones and hurricanes have intensified over recent decades and it's going to get much worse. All that and more still to come on Space Time. China has ended 2021 with a record 55 orbital rocket launches, that's more than any other nation, and 10 more than the United States. Its final missions of the year included a Long March 3B, carrying what Beijing describes as an experimental communications satellite, and a Long March 2D with at least one and possibly two spy satellites. The Long March 3B mission was launched from the Zhaichang Satellite Launch Center in Sichuan Province. It carried the Communication Technology Demonstrator 9 spacecraft, which will test multi-band high-speed satellite communication technologies. Meanwhile, the Long March 2D was launched from the Zhuquan Satellite Launch Center in northwestern China's Gobi Desert. Its payload was the Tianhuai-4 satellite, Tianhuai meaning sky mapper in English. Beijing claimed that Tianhuai-4 will conduct scientific experiments, land resource surveys and geologic information collection. But in reality, it's yet another military reconnaissance spy satellite, or possibly two, as the satellite dispenser used for the launch is designed to carry two spacecraft, and previous launches of this type of satellite have involved the deployment of twin spacecraft. Since 2016, Beijing's launched more than 155 Earth observation, surveillance and reconnaissance satellites. They're designed to provide near-continuous high-resolution optical and electronic monitoring of areas of interest to China as part of what Beijing euphemistically describes as its build-up to war. As of December 21, 2021, China had an estimated 448 operational spacecraft orbiting the Earth. As well as undertaking more orbital launches in 2021 than any other nation, Beijing also topped the rocket launching lists in 2018 with 39 missions and 2019 with 34 missions. In 2020, China launched 39 orbital rockets, just behind the 44 launched by the United States. This is Space Time. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. A new study warns that tropical cyclones and hurricanes have intensified over recent decades and it's going to get worse. The findings reported in the journal Frontiers of Earth Science suggest that we should expect cyclones to double their destructive power by the late 21st century. Scientists assessed data dating back to 1979 to see how cyclone behaviour has already changed and estimate how it will continue to change as the planet continues to warm. Focusing specifically on typhoon and cyclone impacts in eastern and southeastern regions of Asia, the researchers say that in the years 2075 to 2099, cyclones will travel nearly 100 kilometres further inland, last nearly five hours longer and increase in intensity by at least two metres per second. Russia has started upgrading its air defence systems with the introduction of the new S-550 anti-aircraft and missile system, which officials claim can intercept incoming intercontinental ballistic missiles better than the American THAAD and Aegis systems. 
Moscow says its new surface-to-air missiles are designed to destroy enemy targets out to a range of 600 kilometres. The new system is being deployed as an upgraded version of the existing S-500 Prometheus anti-ballistic missile technology. Paleontologists have discovered a new species of ankylosaur in the subantarctic tip of Chile. A report in the journal Nature describes the spike-tailed Stegoros elangassan as being built like a tank. The dinosaur was about two metres long, with a relatively large head, slender limbs and a flat, frond-shaped tail. Earlier this week, we looked at the fascination people have for the paranormal. And king of paranormal has to be ghosts. Millions of people around the world continue to believe in the existence of ghosts. And just as the political and psychological motivations behind the homo sapien obsession with the paranormal can be easily explained, Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptic says, science can also logically explain the triggering points for ghosts, the things that transform a regular event into a ghostly apparition. Oh, yeah, science being, you know, spoiled sports through and through, aren't they? <laughs> totally, totally. They, they, keep, they keep putting facts in the way of fiction. Oh, swines. Yeah, no. no well, they, they, they try and figure out reasons why people see or feel ghosts. And this is, this is sort of um, things that crop up every so often. They tend to be some very similar things. Obviously, there's cruelly sort of what they call disturbed mental health. So people who are a bit sensitive or fragile might claim they are hearing or seeing things or feeling things. They probably do the same with or without ghosts. Um, external stimulants, which is basically drugs. If you're high, you're more likely to see strange things than if you're not. And it's not necessarily drugs. It could be... They also talk about uh, moulds and fungus oh, and that yeah. sort of thing on That's walls. Right. Yeah, so, yeah, so the old uh, decaying house with mould in it can supposedly give off sort of psychedelic uh, effects to you. Uh, that can be... Uh, and affects obviously emotional situation if you just lost someone especially someone who's trying to find a relative who's died they're in a more sort of uh, fragile situation and they might be more prone to seeing things obviously you know, you're influenced by popular culture movies TV shows, whatever they keep talking about, haunted houses, etc., which makes people believe that these things exist and then they have to just find them. And the most technical one is the thing called the Hertz frequency. And you being a science sort of guy would know about that. 19 Hertz is a very low frequency that you can't hear but may have an effect at the, um, the what's it called, the infrasound level. Um, you know, yeah, vibrations the elephant and or a whale to hear it, yeah. I think you have to hear it, yeah. Or apparently near a wind turbine, uh, turbine. yeah. yeah. Uh, they're picking up infrasound from miles away, apparently, so it's they're very strange. But, yeah, infrasound at 19 hertz frequency is supposed to be a, a thing which affects your brain, right? So it's not a ghost, but it can just be something that uh, affects you and that up, just upsets your equilibrium a little bit. So so that those scientists being um, spoil sports and uh, party poopers, as always, are just trying to find an explanation for things, honestly. I think it's ghosts. Well, I guess that comes back to the, the whole idea of, you know, what pre-science humans were doing and were thinking and trying to explain the world around them. Yeah, I mean, you, know, you go at night time, the world can be a scary place. I think it always has been for people. Oh, yes. you, you can't, death is, well, no, that's not scary. Only if you, beforehand, not afterwards. But, uh, yeah, I mean, sort of that... Packs of wolves <laughs> and, or lions hunting at night. Well, that sort of fear stuff the, would be really scary. Fear the, unknown, fear, fear the unknown fear of the things yeah. you can't see, that you're not quite sure what's going to happen to you. Yeah, that, that, that puts you on edge, obviously, and then you start assuming and presuming things. Now, maybe ghosts exist, but there's no proof of it. Because... Scary things at night can um, get the creative yeah. juices going. I, you know, I've experienced that. I used to work at a radio station in the Blue Mountains, west of Sydney, and walking down a very dark road one night, I mean, I knew there's no such thing as Bigfoot, but by golly, I felt there was. I just got this real shiver down my back, and I knew it was only psychological. I was well aware of that, but nevertheless, the scary feeling was still there. Yeah, there must be something sort of innate in, in humanity yeah. that actually sort of makes you feel these uncertainties and sort of uh, apprehensions, uh, even though you convince yourself it's, it's, it's not true what I'm fearing, but at the same time, yeah, so maybe, maybe it's a primitive thing from a barbaric past or something that it's better to be scared and aware than to be sort of um, apathetic and get eaten by a wolf. That's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. That's the show for now. 
Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider, and from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Space Time store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Space Time patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. And Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 